Today's scripture reading comes from 2 Samuel chapter 16. When David had passed a little beyond the summit, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple donkeys saddled, bearing 200 loaves of bread, 100 bunches of raisins, 100 summer fruits, and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, why have you brought these? Ziba answered, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on. The bread and the summer fruit are for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who faint in the wilderness to drink. And the king said, Where is your master's son? Ziba said to the king, Behold, he remains in Jerusalem, for he said, Today the house of Israel will, be, will give me back the kingdom of my father. Then the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. Let me ever find favor in your sight, my lord and king. When David, King David came to Behurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually, and he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said as he cursed, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The king has avenged on you all the blood. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zariah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go and take off his head. But the king said, What, I, what have I to, to do with you, you sons of Zariah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David, who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjaminite? Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for, for his cursing today. So David and his men went on the road. While Shimei went along the hillside opposite him, and cursed as he went, and threw stones at him, and flung dust. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan, and there he refreshed himself. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, how great thou art. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here today. Lord, I pray you be with us. Lord, push out the distractions of the weak. Lord, whether it was joy this week or heartache, Lord, I pray you would clear our hearts and minds, help us be able to focus on you in your word, be here and now. Lord, I pray you'd be with Mark, bless him, bless all his study. Lord, I pray you'd speak through him, grant us open hearts, Lord, discerning minds, and that everything done here today would be for your glory and our good. In your name, amen. Amen. Good morning again. Uh, just a word of note before we get into the passage. Um, our office manager, Becky, her and her husband, I had said it before, they are in London visiting family. They're not here till uh, Friday, but they left Tuesday afternoon. And that means I had to get the bulletin insert to her early so she could get everything put together. And so on Monday... I had already done some studying, but if you ever talk to me about how my study goes Monday, I go, yeah, this is what it's about. And then by Thursday, by the time I actually write everything out, I go, I had no clue what it actually was about. And that's what happened this week. So if you got her email, this is all on me, none of it is her. The email said, honoring and cursing the king. Did anybody actually look at the email? Yeah, a few. Well, one. Okay, two. Thank you. Becky will be happy to know that a lot of people read the emails. And then as I worked through the passage more in depth, I began to realize it has absolutely nothing to do with honor. Well, very little to do with honoring and cursing the king. That what it has to deal with is the sovereignty of God. That's where our focus is going to be this week. So I had to change the bulletin insert. And so somebody goes, the bulletin insert's white. When did we do that? I'm like, well, when I messed up and then I had to reprint it and put everything back in the bulletin after she had already left. 
So that's all on me. So if you're confused as to why things are different in the email and now in the bulletin, that's on me. But I guess I'd rather take that because that's what the passage is actually more fully about. And it also gives you a little hint into the process throughout the week that I go through. This is about God's sovereignty. He says, David says, for the Lord has told him, Shimei, to curse me. God has told this man to curse his anointed king. So that's where we're heading. How do you react when things don't go your way? Did anybody have a week this last week where everything went your way? Did anybody have something going where nothing went your way? Or at least it felt like nothing went. Yeah, there we go. It's more like that, right? Okay, maybe the first time you endure it, you're like, okay, that's life. Life isn't fair. You keep a good attitude because, you know, it's only happened once. And then it happens again and again and again and again. And you're like, really? What about those days, those weeks, those months where it seems like nothing is going your way? How do you react when day after day, situation after situation, person after person, everything and everyone seems to have it out for you? You make a plan and then it just explodes. Now I want you to put yourself in David's shoes. In the past 11 years, your daughter was raped, your son was murdered, your other son, the one who actually murdered your son, your first son, Absalom, wants you dead so that he can take your throne, and now you're fleeing for your life. You have very little food, and not everybody is sad to see you go. That's a bad 11 years. Not to mention however many years it was before that because he committed adultery with Bathsheba, murdered Uriah. But David, to be honest, probably should not have been surprised at his situation. In fact, I don't think he was surprised at what was happening because after his sin with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah, his minimizing his own sin before God, David was warned by God himself through his prophet Nathan that the sword would never depart from his house. That's in chapter 12, verse 10. What David is now enduring is the consequence of his own actions, his own sins against God. And David, David knows this. Now, I have to disclaim, put a disclaimer here, right? Not everything that, that's bad that happens is because I have sinned. That's, that's not scriptural. Now, it does happen. We have consequences for our sins, but there are some times when things just happen because we live in a fallen world or because of the sins of the people around us. If you, if, go read the book of Job. Go read Job. It is filled with Job is righteous, he has not sinned against God, and yet everything and everyone seems to be against him. David knows that his sin with Bathsheba is why this is happening to him at this moment. He knows that everything that he is living through at that moment is a result of his sin over a decade earlier. And one would think that David then would just throw his hands up, he'd give up, he'd lose heart, and become angry with God. I mean, that's, that's our tendency at times, is it not? When things go bad over and over and over and over and over again, you're like, really, God? I'm supposed to be your child, and now you're doing this, and you're allowing this? Why? Why? Are you mad at me? <sighs> and we could easily... Blame God and leave God and say, well, a loving God would never do this to me. David, he doesn't do any of that. Not, none of that. As he's fleeing Jerusalem, an opportunity arises from God, which is but the first step towards David's return. We talk about this, talked about this a couple weeks ago. Right after praying for God to turn the counsel of Ahithophel to foolishness, 
Hushai arrives out of the blue. And David immediately sees this as an opportunity from God. The Lord has not forsaken David, and the Lord has not forsaken his people Israel. God's help doesn't stop at that moment, though, because Ziba and Shimei enter the scene. One is to help David, the other one is to curse David. But in the end, David never lose sight of God's sovereignty. Because, and this is what sovereignty is, to have, we worship a God who is sovereign. What does that mean? It means he is the supreme ruler and king who has all legal authority over the entire universe, including David, including Shimei including Mephibosheth and all those other crazy names. He is king of all of it. So, in this passage today, who is Ziba and why does he arrive? Well, when David first became king, he wanted to take care of the family of his friend Jonathan, the son of King Saul, his predecessor. Ziba, one of Saul's former servants, told David of this man called Mephibosheth, who is the last of Jonathan's sons. And so David brings Mephibosheth into his own household, caring and providing for him. And now the same Ziba arrives as David is fleeing the city. But this time he, he arrives alone. You would think Mephibosheth would be with him, but he's not. He arrives by himself with donkeys and supplies for David and for those that are fleeing the city. So where was Mephibosheth? Well, according to Ziba, he's staying in Jerusalem, hoping that the kingdom of Saul would be restored to him. In other words, Mephibosheth, this man who David brought into his own house, of a, a grandson of his rival, he cared for him. He loved him as a brother and as a son. This man is now turned against David too. That's a pretty bad day. Now the question then, because we ask ourselves, is this actually true? Does Mephibosheth really believe that Absalom, you know, the crazy guy who wants to kill his dad, does, does Absalom really desire, um, or Mephibosheth really believe that Absalom, who wants the throne for himself, is actually going to just hand over the kingdom to Mephibosheth? And you think you go like, well, probably not. That's a pretty small percentage, right? And does Ziba really think that David is going to take him at his word? Are the donkeys and the supplies, maybe they're a bribe for David to be put in his good graces? Now, as it seems to happen with Scripture, we're not told. It doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us where Ziba's heart is. It doesn't tell us why he did this or why he does that. But what we do know is that David gives everything that once belonged to Mephibosheth and Saul to Ziba. And so it seems like David is taking Ziba at his word. But even then, three chapters from now, chapter 19, we're going to find out that Ziba's words may not have been as trustworthy as they appeared. But that's three chapters from now, and I'm not going to give that away. You can read it for yourself. It's tempting to ask the question, is Ziba for or against David? But that's actually the, the wrong question to ask. The real question is, where does God stand on the issue? Is God for David or is God against David? Now, as David enters a small village about a mile and a half outside of Jerusalem, he encounters a very loud and very disgruntled man. Shimei is of the family of Saul. He's related to the old king, and he's far from a loyal subject to David. And as David and his, his company approach, Shimei begins to hurl insults and curses at David. He blames David for the death of Saul and for all of Saul's household. He believes that God has given the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of Israel into Absalom's hands because of David's evil actions. Oh, if he only truly knew David's evil actions. 
from over a decade earlier. And yet David does and says nothing. He endures it. Even as Shimei not only curses continually, but begins to throw stones at them. How humiliating that must be. And finally, dare I say a man after my own heart, Abishai, let's be honest, he pleads with David, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and cut off his head. Anybody go, amen? I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's our reaction, right? How dare? This is what you're talking, you're talking about. If you don't believe me, get on Facebook and social media and see how people react to presidential elections. That's where our heart goes. David, though, he... He refused. What do I have to do with you? And what he's saying there is, don't, no, don't, don't shut him up. Don't shut up Shimei. Don't silence him. And he actually gives three, David gives three reasons why, which ultimately then point to one, which we've already said is the sovereignty of God. First, what if Shimei was cursing David because the Lord had told him to? That's in verse 10. Then to silence Shimei would be an attempt to silence God, which is never a good position to put yourself in. If you're standing against God, bad things happen. Second, if David's own son is seeking his life, then how much more a relative of Saul, the man whom David replaced? And then third, if Shimei's cursing is unjust, God will take care of it. God's going to repay David with good. And in all three of these reasons, David places himself and the situation in the hands of God, which is normal for David. He has done this his whole life, whether watching sheep in the field, fighting Goliath, running for his life from Saul, fighting a civil war in Israel, being called out by God for his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah were fleeing from his son who wants to take his life. David is no stranger to hardship and he's no stranger to putting his trust in God in the midst of difficult situations. David humbles himself and he places himself in the sovereign hands of the Lord. And in the end, spoiler alert, Shimei gets his comeuppance by Solomon. And the supplies that were given by Ziba, remember the donkey and all the supplies, which may or may not have been a bribe, are actually used to refresh David and his company after a long and tiring journey. So even if Ziba's re, uh, meaning behind the gift was evil, it was used by good for good by God to strengthen David and his company. You see, everything, everything, is in the hands of the Lord. That God is sovereign, again, points to his kingly, supreme rule and legal authority over the entire universe, including David's life and including yours and mine. All things are in his hands, and he doesn't let go of his sovereignty when we face hardships, it's not like when I, when I have a hardship come into my life, God goes, oh, I left my sovereignty at home. I'm sorry. Let me go grab it first. Like, no, God is still sovereign over the good and the bad. He doesn't let go of his sovereignty when we face the repercussions of our sin, just like David. And he doesn't let go of his sovereignty when things are easy for us either. He has been is and always will be sovereign. That is the God that we worship. And so why not put your trust in the one who has all things under his authority and control? Now, there are three things we find in this passage. Now, if you know me well, I, I hate even saying those words because I am not a three-point sermon guy. But you know what? It's there. We have to deal with it, okay? This is the scripture's fault is the three-point sermon. I'll just move on from that, okay? There are three things we find in this passage about God 
that we can then apply to our own lives as his people. Now, this is, this is one of the whole things about scripture. A lot of times we read scripture and we immediately apply it to our life. What does this have to do with me? But the way we should read scripture and the right way, yes, I'm saying the right way to do it is to go, what does this say about God? And then what does that teach me about myself? So we've already learned. You look at the passage, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Okay, now how does that apply to my life then? If it's true that God is sovereign, then how does my life then, or how should my life reflect that sovereignty? Or how should I see how things are happening in my life or in the world around me? So first, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. This is what it says. In him we have obtained an inheritance. He's talking about believers, Christians. We've read, we received, obtained an inheritance, eternal life. The presence of God, a relationship with God, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. We serve and worship a God who works all things. What does that mean? All, all things. It doesn't mean like, well, a few things here and a few things there. No, all things according to what? The counsel of my will. No, right there you should have said heresy, right? No, his will, according to the counsel of his will. This means that all things, good and bad, are worked together according to God's will. He is sovereign over all circumstances. Financial blessing and hardship, friendships and bullies, sinful rebellion, obedience, health and sickness. I mean, you just continue to go on with this list. He is sovereign over all of it. Whether our lives are stable or we're fleeing for our lives from a child who desires to kill us, God is supreme ruler over all of it. In and through both the good and the bad, God is using them, is moving them to accomplish his will. This is why we can say God uses my sin. He does not cause me to sin. I do just fine all on my own. But then he takes my sin and he uses it. It's all part of his plan. And he uses it to accomplish his will. That, isn't that crazy? I mean, you hear that. That's nuts. Is it not? Or am I just the only one who thinks that? Now, that doesn't give me right to just sin all over the place because God's going to use it anyway. No, that's not the point of that. The point of it is when we sin as God's people and the fallen world we live in, those who sin, God uses all of it for the purpose of accomplishing his will. Now, Jesus is no stranger to this. According to Acts chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus was delivered up to Pilate, to the authorities. He was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Jesus was crucified and killed by wicked men, all according to the will of God. Let that sink in. But so was Christ's resurrection and ascension. Both the good and the bad, because I would say the cross is actually really good for us. It was bad because it was a horrible, horrible death, but without it, we're lost. He uses the good and the bad. They were all worked by God so that the will of God would be accomplished in Christ, namely, so that I could be saved from the wrath of God for my sins. And if it was true for Christ... So it is with all of those who are his disciples. Second, God works all things for good. 
Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 31. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of God, uh, of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. See, Christ's horrible death including everything leading up to it throughout all of history, was worked by God for good. If Christ had not suffered and died, forgiveness of sins, a restored relationship with God, and eternal life would never be a possibility for any of us. Christ's death leads to his resurrection and his ascension, which then leads to our salvation the presence of God abiding in us through his indwelt Holy Spirit and living eternally in the presence of God with glorified bodies. That's what that passage is saying. And if he can do such things with with such horrible circumstances, what good is he working through David's troubles or our difficult circumstances, which let's be honest, is nothing compared to to what David's dealing with and what Christ dealt with. The fact that there's snow on the ground is kind of piddly, isn't it? As mad as we may be about it. Third, God is my helper. Psalm 118, verses five through seven. Did you notice, talk about the sovereignty of God. Did you notice that Psalm 18 was on the screen during worship? I just giggled to myself, which is hilarious even on top of it with all the music that we've been singing because he thought I was, when he picked songs, he thought I was talking about honoring and cursing the king. Oh no, we're talking about the sovereignty of God. And guess what? It's about the sovereignty of God, the music, the scripture. Psalm 118 verses five through seven. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. David understood that God was on his side, not because he was morally good, David being morally good, but because he was the anointed king of Israel. He was God's child. Christ, too, understood that God was on his side. Unlike David, Christ, of course, was morally and spiritually perfect. He was without sin, and yet he always turned to his father. He'd find a hill, he'd go up onto it, and he'd spend all night praying. In the garden before his arrest, he cries out to God for strength to face the coming storm. But God's help isn't limited to David and Jesus. Hebrews 13.6 actually quotes Psalm 118, and it quotes it in the context of contentment. Whatever we may face, good or bad, God will never leave nor forsake us as his people. He is always a help in all of our circumstances. And if the God who is sovereign over all of the universe is our helper, then what do we have to fear? What can man do to us? Our finances, our relationships, they can all be ruined. Our lives could even be taken from us. But our helper is always near. We will always be his and he will always be there for us even as we suffer the consequences of our sins and the consequences of living in a fallen world. But that's for those who believe. Now, this is going to be hard to hear, this next section. Because, section, the next paragraph, don't, don't freak out, it's okay. Because if God is sovereign over all things, and we who are his people, we who are saved by grace, by God, through Christ, through faith in him, if we say he is sovereign over our lives, 
and he's sovereign over the universe, that means he's also sovereign over those who do not believe. And we have to talk about it. I could stop right here and be like, amen, praise Jesus. But what about those who do not believe? Those who reject Christ, those who refuse to believe Well, you too are in God's sovereign's hand, sovereign hand. It is true that God works all things together for good, period. We like to think as believers, he's, he's working for my good. No, he's working for his good, and his good is our good. That's what that verse is saying. So if he's working all things for his good, what happens for those who do not believe? God still works things for his good, but not for the good of those who do not call him his sa- their savior, treasure, and Lord. Their savior as in forgiving my sins, removing the wrath of God, paying the, ra- for the, the price of the wrath of God for my sins. He's my savior, my treasure, the most important thing in my life. I could lose all things, but if I've got Christ... In the end, I will live because I will die and go into his presence. Or Lord, he reigns over all things in my life. And my goal in life is to strive to grab everything and make it devoted completely to him. That's what we mean when we say those who believe in Christ, are his, he is their savior, their treasure and Lord. But if you do not say that, if you refuse to believe, God is sovereign. And because he is sovereign, he has brought you here this morning or listening to it online to hear these words. Jesus is the only way. He's the only truth and the only life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Those who confess and believe, those who are saved by Christ's work upon the cross, those who fear God and not man, they find peace and joy and comfort and power to persevere through anything in life. And they will look forward to standing before the Father to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And they will receive the blessing, the inheritance of God God himself and eternal life in his presence. Believe. Because if you do not, God is working all things for good, for his good. But if you do not believe, it is not for your good because the only destination for all eternity is not in his presence. It's in hell. And he is having you hear these words today to say, believe. Because the way he will work, you will not see as good at the end of all things. We worship a sovereign God. We worship the king of the universe. We worship a God who has every life and every soul in his hands. And he is working all things to the counsel of his will. He's working all things for his good. And we see David's example to us and Christ's example to us that if we believe, if we are his disciples, if we trust in the sovereign hand of God, then whatever we face this week, or let's make it more personal, whatever we face when we get home, when we walk out this door and we enter our home, or we enter our work, or we enter school, as his people, we stand firm that God is in control 
And who better to trust than the one who is the king of all the universe? Who? A politician? A parent? A boss? Money? Sports? Pleasure? They will all fail us. In the end, they will all fail. A wonderful church who loves Jesus will fail you if you are counting on that church to save you. Only God does that. And as God's people here, we are just striving to sit and stand and live in the sovereign hand of our God and trusting him. Who better to trust than the king of the universe? Father, I pray this morning that you would, whatever we are facing as your people, that God, you would remind us that this is nothing for you. And, and even if you're not working fast enough for us, it's still in your hands. You do not work at the time and in the way that we desire. You work in your way and in your time and you use all things, Father. You are sovereign over all of it and you're working it all to the counsel of your will. And as your people, it is good to be under your sovereign hand. And Father, for those who do not believe, we pray. Father, we pray in earnest and with passion God, that you would grab a hold of their heart, that you would soften them. We pray, Father, you would provide opportunities for us as, as your people to speak the truth of the gospel into our neighbors and friends, our family, so that they may hear and know the truth that you are God over all things and we can trust you. Save them, Father. We ask you, we pray, we beg you to save them. God, we give ourselves to you. We put ourselves in your hands. Help us each day to wake up glorifying you and handing ourselves over to the king of the universe. And let it all be for your glory, <clears throat> your greatness, and for your kingdom. We ask this in your name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we sing our final song?